Now, with the words I just read from the last chapter of John, the risen Jesus commissions Peter to take care of his sheep. And he does this not only once, but he does it three times. These words are shared with Peter around a charcoal fire on the lake shore with the sun rising over the lake and with the smell of grilled fish. It was only a few evenings before this around another charcoal fire in the courtyard of the temple when Jesus denied Jesus, when Peter denied Jesus three times. What happened to Peter? How could the bumbling, frightened Peter in the courtyard become the bold Peter who preached in Acts 2 that Jill just read? Or how could this be the beautifully eloquent Peter that we heard in 1 Peter? Is this the same person? Is he really the one that Jesus said would be the foundation of his church? Now, looking at the Bible in a historical way, or what we call historical criticism, is deep in our Presbyterian heritage. We try to prove everything in and around the Bible. Now, of course, history is important, and we do a lot of looking at the Bible in historical context. And, uh, you know, in archaeology, we've learned a lot as well. But we reformed people take this way too far. As Walter Brueggemann uh, once said, now you've heard of Walter Brueggemann, you've heard him in our pulpit and some of the studies that we've done, and Walter Brueggemann is the height of biblical scholarship. He said that this obsession with historical basis of scripture has become a great enemy of preaching. Now, this way of looking at the Bible has become a stumbling block for our tradition. And let me give you a couple of examples of this from our readings. Is John chapter 21, is that an appendix that was added to the book of John many years later? You know, it sure looks like it. When you go and you analyze it, it sure looks like it. And did Jesus really ask three times? Now, scholars will say, well, that's just a literary device, you know, for Jesus to forgive Peter three times after denying him three times. But if we spend all of our effort doing it this way, we miss the warmth of the sun rising over the Sea of Galilee and hearing the crackling of a charcoal fire and the smell of grilled fish. And if we miss that, it's a great shame. Or the other example is what about 1 Peter? The Greek in 1 Peter is very elegant. There is no way that a non-native Greek speaker wrote this book. No less a fisherman. And we can turn ourselves into theological pretzels trying to explain it. You know, did Silvanius, you know, who was one of Peter's companions, did he write it? Or was it written decades later, as many scholars would say, because that's the tradition was to write in the name of the apostles. But again, if we approach the scripture in this way, which we often do, it stifles our appreciation of its beauty and its language. If we only analyze it, we don't hear Peter's melodic words. And I'm so glad that Jill read it in such a beautiful way and uh, in such an emotional way, because that's the way it's meant to be heard. So if we try to control the narrative instead of letting the story unfold, it can turn us into these theological pretzels. If we take Peter's denial only, then we miss the fact that he was faithful. If we take only his impulsiveness, which he had in abundance, we miss his steadiness and his soundness of mind. If we take only his simplicity as a fisherman, we miss his subtlety and his leadership. Jesus chose Peter for a reason, 
And only when we look at the total character of Peter in the total narrative do we see why. And that's why I'm so thrilled that we've been doing these uh, reading entire books of the Bible in one sitting. Now, of course, we used to do that at uh, Linda and Mark's house uh, until the COVID, COVID pandemic. But um, even we've carried on even after that. And up to this point, we've done all four Gospels. We did First and Second Timothy. We did Micah. We did Romans. And we just did uh, Nahum and, um, or Nahum, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, uh, Nahum and Jonah last week in comparison over Zoom. And it was wonderful. And what makes this so great is that we hear the stories the way they were intended to be heard, orally and as unfolding narratives. And if you haven't joined one of them, I really encourage you to do it next time because it's fantastic. I think the next time we're going to do Revelation. So many Christians try to find hidden meanings in Scripture, desperately trying to find meanings behind the text. That's very much in our tradition as well. Or worse yet, we try to codify a rule book from Scripture, missing the big picture of God's steadfast love. So I wanted to read just a little piece of the first Peter, first Peter one through uh, one, six through seven, just to hear the beauty of the language. In this, you rejoice, even now for a little while, you have had to suffer various trials so that the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Even in English, you can hear the, the rhythm and the, um, the beauty, the beautiful flow of the Greek. Now, I'm not an expert in Greek by any means, but I'm learning. <laughs> and I've learned enough to see that our translations that we have in English are often more realistic and rigid than what you read in the Greek. Um, and I've also learned that a lot of times this has to do with we lay our theology on top of the scripture instead of letting the text unfold. So I really encourage you to let just let the text come to you and let it unfold. And the other thing I really encourage with you too is that there are really so many other ways to experience the word of God than what our traditions, our white European men in our traditions have taught us to hear. You can listen to the scriptures as a woman or as a disabled person or a person of color or as a Native American person. There are many other ways to hear it. And as we go into our future, we need to think this way in order to be in our right mindset for the future. So I have thought, and I know you have too, what will become of our congregation? What will we look like after this pandemic? Will we bring in new people? Will we grow in the future? Will we not? But I've come to see that those are often not the right questions to have. In being with you and working with Presbytery and, and being in seminary, I've learned a great deal about the legacy of faithfulness. And I've learned that growth comes from spiritual maturity, not from programs and not from other things. And it comes from who we are rather than what we do. I've also learned what hurts churches the most, and it has happened not just here, but around the world and around the United States. What hurts churches the most is worry and fretting. And what I think that, uh, oh, excuse me, 
I'd lost my fire, <laughs> is worry and fretting. And it's not that it's bad to get wake up calls. It's not bad that, you know, we get shots of adrenaline when we need them. But it's really more about that constant worry that grinds you down and makes it so that you don't, it, that you're, we're not in touch with our greater story. Let's never forget that every time we've needed to reach further, you have stepped up. And every time we thought that we were going down, and in the 30, almost 32 years of uh, being at Reedville, Carol and I have been at Reedville, we've seen a lot of cases of where it looked pretty, pretty tough. Every time that happened, new people came and enriched us, and we grew. And many of you, in fact, most of you came at critical times in our unfolding story as a church. In short, we have been resurrected over and over again. So if we fret about metrics and we take them as signs of our spiritual health, that's not a good place to be mentally or to be in the right mindset. It's our nature to overanalyze and spend too much try time trying to make ourselves into something that we're not. Instead, we should listen to the Holy Spirit and watch for God's hand through our history. Now, you've heard about the VCI, the Vital Congregations Initiative. You haven't heard about it as much as I think that Jeff and Jill, who are both working on this, wanted you to hear about this. Because I think, I don't know, I think you were supposed to go to some kind of retreat or something and that didn't happen and all of this happened. But the VCI is really important for us because it's about putting us into the right mindset. It's about placing ourselves in a place where the 20,000 new people that are be, will be at our doorstep and prepare for that. If we grow, it's God's will. If we are strong in God's mission, it's God's will. We can't control our future, but we can only let the narrative play out. We didn't plan to have a pandemic, but we're staying together and we're worshiping together. Instead of fretting over small things, instead of fretting over verses, let's look over the whole story and see the rich history about who we are and where we're going. So we have an important task coming up here. And it's not to bring people to our way of thinking or doing things the same way as we have done them before. It's not to pick everything apart and parse all the verses. It's to create a new heart in ourselves and to invite other people to join us in creating that new heart and to be part of our story. So what happened to Peter? He changed, he grew, and his story has inspired humanity for 20 centuries. So I can ask, and you can ask, what happened to you? And what happened to you? And I can see all the squares on the screen here. <laughs> what happened to you? And how has your story changed and how has your story um, help us come together and inspire us to grow in, in love for Jesus Christ. This is what our story will be together here at the Reedville Church. So let us pray. Holy Father, in your name we serve. In your spirit we grow. And with the touch of Jesus, we heal. Inspire us to see the whole story of our ministry together as it unfolds. Help us to pay attention to our growing relationship with you. Not to fret over small things and not to dwell on setbacks, but to boldly reach out and do your work no matter what, to be your resurrection people in a new day. In the blessed name of Jesus Christ, amen.